There is a big difference between a history embroidered with propaganda, such as the Earth, the Earth. We are Myth Vision. Welcome to Myth Vision Podcast. Your host, Derek Lambert. Co-host, Dr. Luther G. Williams is in the back cave right now editing his uh, book so that he has all the secrets of life in there. We'll let you know when that book's out so you guys can get a hold of it. Make sure you guys get a copy of it. I don't know if he's going to have it electronic. I don't know anything yet. All I know is he's got a lot of power-packed stuff. For those of you who are on the question of the historicity mythicism, mythology, esoterics, numerology, uh, anomatology, understanding names, meanings, secrets and stuff that are kind of hidden in the text that kind of tell you clues about what we're about to do today in terms of talking to a special guest here. We have somebody that I've been waiting for a long time. Um, look, somehow, I don't know how this happens on a flat earth, but uh, you're on the other side of the globe, I think. How are you doing it? I don't understand, Ken. How are you doing? <laughs> I'm doing fine. I'm doing fine. And, uh, you know, it's a pleasure for me to be with you. So it's, it's a little while now since I spoke to uh, a host such as yourself in the States. Uh, we've been a little bit distracted over here with something called Brexit. You may have you may have heard it a little bit. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, great to be with you. Good to be with you, too, sir. And you have a YouTube channel. I go I want to go ahead and plug this channel because. I'm fascinated with it. I really am. I love, first of all, your voice is going to sell the, the hell out of these videos. I mean, your voice, Americans buy up the voice. They love the way you speak. Um, what is the name of your YouTube channel? Is it not Jesus Never Existed? JesusNeverExisted.com. Absolutely, yeah. Should be able to remember that one without too much effort. Yeah, <laughs> JesusNeverExisted.com. Okay, so that's the website. Yep. You do have a YouTube channel. So... He, Guys and gals, go to JesusNeverExisted.com. You see it on your screen. All right. Kenneth Humphreys is a British... Oh, sorry. That's the website. I'm, I'm getting confused already. No, you're fine. You, you're saying the, the YouTube channel yes. is Jesus Existed without the final E. So it's exist, Jesus Never Existed TD at the end. Okay. I'm okay. sure you can flash it up the screen to make it easier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely. Guys, gals, here's his site. So check out this site here, JesusNeverExisted.com. Kenneth Humphreys is a British scholar and activist for atheism who lives in the south of England. He studied for five years at university, graduating with a master's degree in history and social sciences. He subsequently taught for many years in a torrential, uh, ter how do you pronounce that? Ter terial level in the UK? Tertarial? Or uh, I'm not sure what you're referring to there. Um, ter tertiary, is it? Ter tertiary level. <laughs> tertiary level. Ter that means college level. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, I haven't. <laughs> no, I have. I've got my associate's degree, but that's about it. Anyway, he's uh, in the UK and uh, he studied there and abroad, including spells in Turkey and Papua New, Gu New Guinea. His academics pursuit. Pursuits interlaced with the career in computer industry, culminating in the establishment of his own business. Go check out his YouTube videos, too. He's got some computer skills. A writer with a consuming passion for religion and history. Humphreys has never had any religious affiliation and has been a lifelong atheist, rationalist, and a libertarian. I remember as a lad being asked, he says... To leave the Cub Scouts after three weeks because I refused to attend the church parade, but by then I could tie my own knots. My earliest diatribe against Christianity was at the age of 16 in a school debate. Interesting. Despite Humphrey's lack of any confession, confessional or spiritual interest, religion as a social and cultural phenomena, and in particular the historical claims made for Christianity, have been a lifelong study. Ken launched his internationally renowned website, JesusNeverExisted.com, in December of 2001. Since then, the site has received more than 8 million visitors. In December 2005, 
a companion book, Jesus Never Existed, The Tragic Fabrication of a Savior of the World, was published and has been exported to more than 40 countries, republished in India in 2007, and translated into Korean in 2013. In December of 2011, Kim began to make available material on the Jesus Never Existed YouTube channel, which has attracted over 13,000 subscribers and 3 million viewings. In November of 2014, Jesus Never Existed, an introduction to the ultimate heresy, was published in the USA. He is fully occupied as a writer, radio broadcaster, and public speaker and uh, campaigns energetically, and I admit that 100%, against resurgent superstition and unreason. Kin has appeared on numerous TV and radio shows, has debated many Christian apologists, and was a contributing scholar in the documentary Caesar's Messiah. He was the guest speaker at the International Mythicist Conference in Athens in May of 2016, and here he is today go down in the description you'll see all the goodies that you can help the website the youtube channel uh paypal you name it guys let's show him some love ken thanks for joining me on the show brother it's a pleasure it's a pleasure of course i have embraced catholicism since all that was written i'm a devout catholic now no not really uh, <laughs> i was about to say <laughs> what Oh, so <laughs> oh man. Well, very few people, <clears throat> you know, for those of you guys and gals who watched Rocky Balboa, okay, very few people, you know, come out in the mythicist camp and start swinging hard like the Rocky movie, climb up the ranks, meet the Russian face to face and just blah, okay? You are hitting this question hard and I don't hear many mythicists who come out and say the bold statement Jesus never existed. Now, that's a strong statement to make. Well, as a scholar, one has to acknowledge that, you know, that, that to, to state something as an absolute there, you are actually taking a little bit of liberties. I mean, after all, oh, Richard Dawkins says, well, you know, just maybe there's a sort of a point zero one percent chance there's a God. Of course. Yeah. So strictly speaking, yeah, we can't be 100 percent sure. But let me give you my justification. When was the last time you heard a Christian say something along the lines of maybe Jesus saves or maybe you'll go to heaven or there's a possibility that there's a God? You know, they don't mince their words. They are emphatic that their their nonsense stories are valid and absolutely true. And, and, and I, I'm no less certain that they are not. <laughs> they are a fabrication to fool people. So let's let's say what it is. Um, I am pleased that there's an Atlantic Ocean between me and the USA. That <laughs> gives me some sense of security. But apart from that. <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> a lot of fundamentalists where I'm at. A lot. And um, of course, uh, this this question, I, I have to ask, how long have you journeyed into this uh into this idea of the historicity and the mythology of the New Testament, like what made you go, you know, this guy, uh, I don't think he existed to, you know what, Jesus never existed. The evidence is not there. You know what I mean? If, if you're asking me my background on that, um, yeah, it's, what's always interested me from when I was a child is history, particularly the ancient world, the Romans, the Greeks, the Egyptians, all that stuff. And you know, you hear as a child, you're in a public school, you hear about Jesus and you, you sort of think, hmm, where does that fit in with, you know, Julius Caesar and, you know, the invasion of Britain? You know, there's this, it sort of exists in a separate area. So I always had doubts, but it never interested me enough to pursue it because I studied real history and got to familiar with real history. Now, when you study real history for years and years, along the way, you become aware there's a, a huge missing gap you know, there's a gap here of, of, of what should be there if, if, if the story were true, if any of it were true. But where is it? It's missing. And I often used to say to myself, I wish I could find the time to tell Christians that so and so and so and so. It just isn't true. You know, that 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 bit of evidence there 
just doesn't fit with what they are claiming, but they just don't know it. Because Christians aren't particularly interested in the history, are they? They aren't particularly. They, they, want, they like the current mess, don't they? You're, you're saved. Embrace Jesus, you are saved. You know, you're one of the good guys. But so I, I, I used to just pick up this sort of awareness of, of the fraud that's going on and went on for centuries. And then... It was around about the year 2000. I decided I actually would start to write this stuff. And that's when I started my website. You know, I, I started my website. And then, of course, people, w I had people copying the whole website, you know, copying the printing off pages and pages. And then <laughs> it was uh, and after a guy in Egypt said to me, is, is this, you know, he said he'd printed out the entire website. And I said, you know, you know could it be available as a book, you know? So I, then I, I put together the book, you know, then the book came along and I was happy with that. Thought I've done my bit for humanity. I've written the book. It's all there if they want to read it. But then people would say, oh, it's it's a, th a thick book. It's full of long, difficult words. Can you can you sort of give us a little video, you know, five or ten minutes, you know, explaining it in, <laughs> in simple words? So, you know, after a couple of years, yes, I go. So I've, I've done the various videos and, and, you know, you can look up what bit, bit of the nonsense that takes your fancy. And, yeah, and most people are, are far too busy with real life to, to worry too much about this story. Um, and, and so, yeah, then we, then we put it. And now where, where are we at now? Well, I guess it's all out there. Um I suppose uh, we have to make it available for mobile phones, right? It's got to be this size, hasn't it? You know, you you got to shrink it all down so it's easy enough. You know, how how much are you going to do the spoon feeding so they don't have to do any work? But you know, anyway, through through it all, it's a lot of fun. I've had a a, a good giggle about it all. Um, I appreciate you doing that because uh, <clears throat> people like me, I mean, I I have to beat myself up. I, I have very difficult time to sit through a long book. But then again, I've done a lot of construction in my life and I could put headphones in my ears and listen for hours while working. Whereas when I get home, I'm so tired and to read, my eyes are wanting to shut. And uh, <clears throat> I do appreciate that because there are some people who obviously probably can't keep up with those words as well, but I could definitely listen and hear. So uh, I'm one of them guys. But um, pertaining to this topic. Yeah, I, and, and honestly, I have I have accepted that now. I, I realise a love of books is is a really a dying thing. Yeah, you know, we we are not in that age anymore. It's all electronic and instant communication. And why not? You know, if you, I, I I can appreciate you know a, a three minute advert on the television is a wonderful communication it says so much it tells you a little story in a very compact form often with an, a jingle that sticks in your mind very effective so let's go down that route okay you know, let's be yeah. punchy let's do it and we're doing it here now you know it's so ken what was what was it that made you go you know what this guy this guy uh these are these are some things that made me question and I, whatever whatever evidences you have because i could see the question of whether there was a jesus becoming more and more wanting, okay, it, it, it really was needing help. Uh, the historicists have been really biased for a long time, and, and, and the layers of mythology, I mean, this isn't like, oh, there's layered mythology on a Caesar, or this isn't, no, this is not a mythologized man like Caesar. We have so much evidence of the human, the, the actual uh, person, that this guy was not God through and through running the whole damn shabam. This guy, Jesus, seems mm. to be layered with allegories and things that just don't seem unreal. They're unrealistic. So you want to go into a few evidences of that, and I want to get into Paul. So stay tuned if you're watching this. We're going to talk about some Paul stuff, too, because he's been hunting him for a long time. So, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, let me just say up front, for most of my life, I believed there was a Jesus, you know. I didn't study Jesus per se. I mean, what's there to study outside the new, you know, the Gospels? What is there to study? I mean, there is no real history available, and and it, it didn't interest me, you know. Okay, but I did think probably some rebel, some rebel, some sort of uh, uh, you know, malcontent who who just got himself uh, strung up by the Romans one day. Big deal, you know. Um, it's only when you actually 
take the step of saying, well, let's put, you know, let's really assemble what we do know about him. Then you discover the primary documents of Christianity are extremely um, suspect. You know, we don't know who the authors are. We don't know where they were written, when they were written, and they overlap in outrageous ways, as well as contradict each other in outrageous ways. And these are the primary documents. So you can't sort of visit the, you know, the home of Jesus or the, the school he went to or, you know, <laughs> there's nothing there. There's just nothing there. You have this crazy, incomplete story and a stupid nativity tale that's tacked on in, in, in two of the Gospels, but basically they begin with a man. You've got somebody at the door there, by the way, <laughs> behind you. That, that had to be an apparition or a ghost. That might have been Jesus. I don't know, man. <laughs> That's what it, the Holy Spirit was with us. Um, Hallelujah. Yeah. Uh, uh, so you, you, you know that. So that this should surely, with any rational being, raise questions. If if this person existed in any real fashion, why is there nothing, nothing, to substantiate him? Because he clearly, if he existed as this sort of malcontent who was around for a few years and then got 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 uh, crucified, um, why didn't anyone notice at the time? You know, if if he was a very ordinary guy, then well, there wouldn't be a religion. So if this fantastic guy, this charismatic man, you know, son of God, existed. Why did he not impress anybody for at least 30, if not 50 years, before they wrote down any sort of story about it? Then you start thinking, my God, could the whole thing be an invention? Now, I would, I'm not certainly not the first person to every, you know, say, hang on, this is all made up. But I started then to look at some books that, that were around at that time. I mean, uh, you'll remember uh, Dorothy Murdoch's, uh, you know, Acharya's um, uh, book uh, uh, on the, 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 what's it called? The Christ the, Conspiracy. The, the yes. Christ That's right. Um, you know, it, it was a, 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 and I thought, OK. She was saying some things that I couldn't accept. She got a little bit into New Age stuff that I thought, no, she's getting a bit flaky there. But essentially the story of questioning the, how it came about, um, yeah, I thought, she's onto something there, and I'll, I'll follow up on this. And so, you know, we, we became good friends because we were in parallel lines. I love her, she by the way. She wrote about stuff that... Yeah, and it was very sad that, you know... Um, but... So we would occasionally talk to each other and email and so on, and 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 we backed each other up in a world which was very hostile. I mean, you know, you, you know, the, 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 I mean, people Christians used to write to me and say, "You're making yourself look stupid." Everybody knows, everybody knows Jesus existed. You can't say that. All you can say is he wasn't the Son of God. You can start there if you really must. And I'm thinking, on, on your bike, you know, you're not telling me where to start the debate. And so, yes, I started to look for the evidence. And, you, and then you just take a simple proposition. You take any one of the stories told about Jesus, these little little snippet stories of, you know, walking up a mountain or, you know, <laughs> taking yeah. a trip by the, the seaside, you know, and, and you, it doesn't actually hang together. You know, it's it, it it the the towns are not known. You know, the 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 the, the plausibility of of the, of the propositions doesn't work. You need to take this cleansing of the temple as if as if that was possible. As if that was possible. If huge oh, you know, huge temple concourse, thousands of people gathered for the Passover, and and then it, one man with a whip, and he he gets them all out, <laughs> and. Nobody arrests him. Nobody knocks him down. You know, the, the whole thing is, that's ludicrous. That's ludicrous, you know. And any story that you look at, you know, just type, where, let's start at the beginning. Where does Mark start? He, Jesus, I've been, been chased into the desert and coming back again, you know. He, he, he's walking around the Sea of Galilee and he sees, you know, 
Mark uh, Mark and Luke or somebody, and he says to them, follow me. And they just abandon everything and follow him. And you think, yeah, people do that all the time, don't they? You know, (laughs) someone comes by, you give up all your families, your business, you just follow off some some hippie. And why? He hadn't performed any miracles at that stage. It's just sort of sheer personality. Follow me, and off they go. And you think, this isn't real. This is just a story. It's a story with a theological purpose to talk about, you know, what someone coming from heaven might have said if it were if it's all possible. Ken, and so it goes on, it goes on, it goes on. I love that. No, no, no. We're going to pause for a second on that. And I want to just kind of like something that I, you know, when you've been studying it for a while, and I have been studying this for a while, not nearly as long as you guys, but but something new to me, and I guess – those of my guests and those who are watching this who might not be obviously as adept to it as you or Dr. Carrier or Dr. Price, uh, some of the guys who are well immersed in understanding the the skepticism uh, side of things, which most just, like you said, presuppose historians have been regurgitating the historical Jesus for 2,000 years, so now, or you know, roughly 2,000, and now we've been handed down this, hey, look at what everybody thinks about Jesus, so you should be thinking the same thing. You're crazy if you don't think so. Yeah, and by the way, the earth is flat, so you're thinking the earth is a globe. You're crazy. So anyways, um, this is something that red flag to me. You said how these gospels overlap. They contradict. They do this, and that's 100% a fact as I've been researching this. And so what gets me is not just that the gospels themselves are doing this. We know for a fact that church fathers, I'm going to use the word, molested the text, okay? So you have to ask yourself, if these church fathers are molesting this text to make it say things and to add doctrines and remove and, and, and possibly even not give us books like 1 Corinthians, there's no telling where these some of these books are. Real 1 Corinthians, because what we have is really 2nd and 3rd. And, and all these things, possibly, I'm not saying that that's that, that's just a theory, um, but when you say that and you go, okay, when this thing has so many thumbprints on it and it's obviously been damaged purposefully, okay, how can you really look at this thing and say, oh, you know what, with certainty, like Dr. Bart Ehrman has, that Jesus exists and here's what we can know about him. How do you know for certainty? Because mm-hmm. he makes an absolute, I've seen him, I've heard him, brilliant man, he is, he's a scholar. But man, he comes out swinging saying, we know for a fact, we have absolute certainty that Jesus Christ existed. And mm. I, I think mm-hmm. there should be a big question mark there and say there's a probability that he exists. He doesn't do that. He sides with the Christians when yeah. it comes to making that absolute statement. Yeah, Bart Ehrman is, is, a, is a special case. I mean, we all know, I think, that he trained very extensively for the priesthood. You know, he went to Moody Bible College. He, he, he went to, you know, the, you know, Princeton or wherever it was. You know, he, he, And it, it's because of his familiarity with the text that he lost his belief system, so he says, you know. But I believe somebody who grew out of that, uh, social background with a clientele very much in the Bible area, you know, that he's never gonna, he's never gonna say, yeah, well, okay, I realize he didn't exist, you know, but all of his work directs towards that. He talks about fraud, he talk, you know, he talks about all the alternative gospels that are tossed out, you know, it, it, and, and yet at the end of the day, he said, oh yeah, but it, it still existed, folks, it still existed, you know, you can, st- you can stay with, 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 you know, with your church, you don't, don't be threatened, you know, <laughs> and, it, it, and it's, it's, it's academic dishonesty, to be honest, it's academic dishonesty, but he, you know, he, unfortunately, people like that, they have, uh, primary position in terms of propaganda they're you know the, the access to uh, the, the listening public as it were and after all it is more successful or easier perhaps to sell a message like that than the the the, 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 the less less the less happy message that actually he didn't exist god doesn't exist you're actually all going to die you know and that's life you know, live, live it as it is, but that's life. It's much easier to say to people, 
Jesus loves you. He'll always love you. You'll be with your loved ones in heaven. You know, just you just subscribe. You just keep keep your membership, and you know we'll go with that. You know, and so he's he, he's a successful salesman. He sells he sells the message. He goes on selling the message. Okay, uh, <clears throat> I want to go back a little little bit here. When do you date the Gospels? Are you with mainstream the the scholars who are skeptics though, and saying? Hey, uh, these are probably written anywhere from 70 to 110. Or do you think like Dr. Price and you say, you know, these things could be early second century, you know, documents. Well, where are you at on the on the spectrum? Well, I mean, I can I can live with either of those propositions, and I I, I don't f even feel it's it's absolutely necessary to right. nail it down. We don't have any copies of first second first century documents none at all we don't have second century copies you know they don't exist we you you, you have to it's fairly late in the day perhaps the beginning of the third century we actually have some of these copies yes there's a couple of fragments earlier but you know they're all questionable how they are dated so I think it's plausible. I mean, if you try and think of what was really the genesis of Christianity, and I'd say, well, the genesis of Christianity was the destruction of temple Judaism, which created a need, an, a, 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 an existential need on the part of the Jewish religion to, to evolve into this crisis situation. And out of that came rabbinic Judaism on the one hand and Christianity on the other. They were the products of that destruction of, of, of the old temple uh, religion. And that is gives you your starting point. Now, whether Mark wrote in, you know, 70, 75, 80, well, I don't care. He wrote sometime during that time. And it's quite clear he it wasn't the word of God because Matthew came along and took Mark's script and he changed it wholesale. He wasn't concerned with what God had said to Mark. He's putting down what he thinks. He, you know, and that's what they did. And so over this period of time, these, these, these Gospels evolved. And it's quite clear that Matthew, I'd say, Matthew came along about 20 years after Mark and, and he was hoping to replace him. He was hoping Mark would fall by the wayside. But it, I think it was too well spread out and, 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 and known that it had to go side by side. I mean, Luke came along, he did a similar trick, trying to, you know, give it some historical veracity. He, he, he's the one who borrowed a whole cell from Josephus and it all went, giving it all these little, you know, authentic little touches, you know, a, a, a timeline, you know, in the, in, in, in the time of Tiberius and, and, you know, all the rest of it. And, and, and and I realised that I I I wondered at first. I thought, why did the church why did the church give itself such a pain over having four gospels rather than one? And then you realise actually four different lies give you lots of lots of scope for replying to the competition. Because if one doesn't have the answer, the other one does. And you just say, oh well, they all had a different perspective on things. So they they kept them all in the frame. You know, and, and that's what we live with. And But, of course, interestingly enough, if you look how they put the, the books into the into the New Testament, they didn't put them in the order they were written because that way Mark would come first. Oh, no, Mark comes after Matthew as if as it, so you wouldn't notice. So you wouldn't notice. You know, it's it's the whole thing is 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 deceit. Multi levels deep, you know, the whole thing. Yeah, totally get it. And I mean, I'm de deconstructing still because when you've had that same thinking for so long, you know, I was a fundamentalist and I went and gradually grew and developed my knowledge and started learning and seeing these things. And the first thing I did when I started to deconstruct was try to rationalize and say, oh, well, listen, it's, it's, uh, it's not literal. So I had to go to allegory to try and make it somehow protect the text because at least if it's allegory, there's some vague esoteric explanation. And don't get me wrong, there's pro there's plenty of esoteric stuff there, okay? Like death, burial, resurrection in three days probably has some esoteric astrology hidden in it. But what, what I'm saying is, is I did it with everything because I was trying to protect it. And um, I tried to come up with, well, um, I had that question, you know, well, is my religion the only true one? Why are all these deity claims, creation claims blood claims, miracle claims of all these other religions. So then I started like expand and it was a good process for me because 
I couldn't go from zero to a hundred. I had to go, okay, well, maybe there's a universal God. Maybe there's a universal spirit overlapping all religions. And then I finally started going, okay, why is Paul saying he's not a liar? And I started going, damn it, what's going on here? You know what I mean? So I wanted to delve into this and ask you um, the best way you can articulate, because I know I'm putting you on the spot, and there's so much you've written and done on this. Where does Paul fit into this this crazy story? Because um, scholars go, well, Paul came first. He probably wrote in the 50s, and he was actively involved in a ministry at that time. And to me, I don't know if you agree with me on this. It's just my opinion. Um, I told this to my co-host. I said, Luther, what are the odds that a guy named Paul – could even be preaching an anti-Torah or even sometimes seemingly anti-Torah message of non-circumcision to Israelites in any way, shape, or form, um, saying, don't worry about dietary laws, don't worry about Sabbath observance. Could he even get away with that before a temple's destruction? To me, it seems like a red flag. But where does Paul fit in your scheme of research? Because I could be wrong. I'm just throwing it out there. Okay, well, I, you, know, you, you know, you got you, you make a good point there. You make a good point there. Paul, to, Paul, to me, is a curious character because it's, we start off with a basic story. And Jesus decides to recruit 12 disciples who are his followers, and he, he gives them the power of, over demons and to heal the sick, you know, he's, you know and, and, and fine. And, yeah, and then he exits the scene, all right? But then... They almost are gone, you know. Then the, we shift over to a character who's not been known before, this guy called Paul, you know. Now, he's introduced, he's introduced as what he's minding the coats when they're, they're, they're doing a stoning of Stephen, you know. And there he is, a young man, minding the coats while they're having a good, you know, stoning, you know, well done. Um, and you think, OK... It's funny that he didn't meet Jesus. After all, he tells us that he was a very keen scholar of, 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 of Judaism. You know, he was very keen, better than all the other scholars he was with. And yet this character, who seemingly at the same stage is causing turmoil all over Galilee and, 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 and Judah, you know, he doesn't meet him, strangely enough. But what he does happen, he becomes the chief persecutor. Lo and behold, you think this young man suddenly is catapulted. He's the chief persecutor. And you think, that, that, that's a bit strange, isn't it? Why does he, you know, he, and, then, and, and, you know, and then you start putting other bits in. But this guy claims he was a Roman citizen. So this chief this chief, you know, persecutor of impressing orthodoxy and correctness is himself, you know, running with running with the enemy. You know, he's he's, he's a collaborator with, with 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 the Romans, and then you think, okay, he persecutes the Jews, the the, the Christians until death. Really, the funny thing is. He has to go to Damascus to find them because the ones in Jerusalem, the disciples, he leaves alone. Those ones he leaves alone. He goes off to Damascus to find. And of course, we know he gets this conversion experience. He doesn't even get there. You know, he gets this conversion experience and he, you know, suddenly he's enlightened and he becomes the person who, who, who imparts the real story. The 12 disciples sort of fall by the wayside. And this, to me, it's like this is a major rewrite. You know, probably the first version of the story it was the twelve disciples, you know, kicking around and but no, that didn't work. And what do we have in Paul? We don't have a simple fisherman or peasant. You know, we have this towering character who has the uh, ability to talk to vast crowds. He has the ability to. To become the founder of churches, and not just one, all over the Eastern Mediterranean. He is the founder of churches, and it's almost like he can breeze into somewhere like Ephesus, you know, found a church, off he goes, and subsequently, what does he do? He writes them a letter saying, how are you getting on? You know, you think, this is like 
a sort of super apostle. This isn't a real person at all. I mean, can you imagine? I mean, you've probably been to Ephesus. I've certainly been to Ephesus. You go there and it was obviously a vast Roman city. Do you imagine it was overturned in a sort of dramatic riot? situation because this Jew arrived one day and started spouting off about uh, a new God. Do you think they would have said, on your bike, sunshine, you know, you know, we're far too busy trading and, you know, doing our things here. You know, it, it, it's all like, but it, the whole thing becomes, it's Paul. Paul was turned, uh, Ephesus over to, uh, 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 upturned it all. And then he goes off, he goes to Greece and Macedonia. And you think, my God, he does everything, doesn't he? Um, and of course, then then it finishes up. Well, he goes to prison in Caesarea. Then he gets shipped off to Rome. And, and then he has a miraculous uh, appearance in Rome. And yet, at the end of the story, it peters out. We don't really know where it happens to him at all. So you have this legend that he was in Rome and set up the church in Rome and, 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 and buried there and so on. I mean, to me, the story is nonsense. It's, it's nonsense that has been sanctified and retold and embellished. And if you go round the Eastern Mediterranean, as I've done, you know, you visit the places that Paul has been, you, of course, find the evidence of Paul, all the evidence that were, was invented by the church in the 4th, 5th, 6th, 7th, 8th, 10th centuries. They've put it all together. So everywhere you can go, you can find bits of Paul all over the Mediterranean. You know, you can find his elbow in, 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 in Malta. You can find his elbow in, 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 in parts of Greece. You know, wherever the story is needed to be told, for the faithful, they invent some of the, the, the evidence that might impress them. And and uh, people love it. It's, people love it, you know. Yes. Yeah, sorry, you were asking about Paul. <laughs> no, I love this. Uh, you're coming in with a totally fresh look, and, and, and you're just uh, saying things we've all thought. Because the way I look at it, honestly, Ken, is if there was a Paul, and I think a lot of people who are trying to say, you know, we like to wrestle these ideas. It's It's a very fun, interesting topic to me. I really enjoy going, well, did he exist? Did he not? I like doing all that, whether he did or didn't. Um, I try to really just try to figure out what I can. And you're right. Such a, such a figure who goes from Saul to Paul in the Acts story uh, you know, to the, the, this cataclysmic uh, character kind of makes you wonder, was he someone else than just a guy named Paul? Or could there have been real people – that he is representative of that made this thing happen. I don't. I don't know. But there's people who think you know, like Operation Messiah. There was a book written um, saying he was actually working and collaborating with the Romans in this operation. I suspect uh, to to do this. That's one theory to try and understand the historical Paul. You see where I'm going with this? So it's like they yeah, they're trying to sure. explain why someone could do such a thing. And that's because they, he had the backing of the, the Romans. Um, the story mm -hmm. gives us kind of indications of, of that. And then you have someone um, – and there's a couple scholars out there that, that think you know different theories of Paul. Uh, Dr. Price even in his book, uh, The Colossal Apostle, which I have not been able to read the whole thing. It's very thick and uh, very hard to, to really get through. But uh, it's very powerful stuff he's saying. And in the intro, I will never forget. He says, at first you're going to say I'm swatting at gnats. But then I'm going to be swallowing whole camels. So get ready, he was saying, because it's a big patchwork, like you said. It's 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 been so played with. We don't know really what was the original, where what was really going on. Yeah, the, 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 I mean, I, yes, we can see images of Paul. We can see statues of Paul. God knows how many churches are named after him. Yes, there seems to be substance, doesn't it? There? there seems to be substance, and I, and I. Certainly, when I started to question Paul, I started to think, oh, it's embarrassing to start saying there's no Paul. I mean, Christ, I've already said there's no Jesus. Well, let's at least have Paul. You know, let's, but, well, yes, and I think maybe a character or a number of characters are, do flesh out the reality. Um, but they, what we have in the finished product is something 
the, as you say, the super colossal Paul. It's, it's, it, no, this, this guy founds churches. He writes the, almost the entirety of Christian theology. I mean, you know, he, does, he doesn't have to go and consult the 12, you know, who actually knew Jesus. <laughs> no, he's, he's got it all, all, all from the astral plane. You know, he's, he's got it all from, 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 from scripture or divine in, you know, inspiration. You know, and, and then, of course, he finishes up as a martyr. He has to finish up a martyr. All, all the early Christians finish up as martyrs, of course, except that we have no evidence of that but you know let's not win trouble by that but i i think yes you can find a a, a one basis for paul if you read uh, josephus for sure he talks about someone called saul who who who, who was very bad towards some uh, some poor people you know he treated them bad and the guy fled jerusalem to go and see nero over over in greece you know and you think Ah, this is interesting. There's a Paul, and then you, you and, and then and then you see another aspect. You 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 hear of of the shipwreck of Josephus. Yep. He's he's on the same voyage, you know, to put Pasquale in in Italy, and, and he's he's he get he gets shipwrecked but gets rescued, and and of course that's what Paul does. And, so, and there's so many parallels. That you start to think, no, somebody has just done a job here, putting together an idealised evangelical apostle. They've, I, they've done an ideal because he's flawless, isn't he? He never loses his temper. You know, he, he's he's kind to uh, children and, and and animals. You know, he's a perfect person, isn't he? He even does some of the miracles. You know, he 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 he, he was he was stoned by the Jews and then recovered enough to go not just for a rest, he goes off for another mission the next day. You know, it's so fantastic that, it, that, 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 that you, you know, unless you're blinded by faith, you, you realise this this is just a story. It's just a story, an inspiring story. Yeah. Nothing wrong in that. I like how you're, how you're piecing a few things together because I've had some guests who come on and also – I myself have tried and said, okay, who's Paul? Paul's Josephus because here, look, it shows that this is this is the Josephus account. And then you go, well, hold on. Paul's Simon Magus because Simon Magus, look at what you know, Dr. Price is showing. And then, hold on. Saul's Absolutely. Jesus Christ. Now you're looking at Jesus because, look, Paul does what Jesus did. And, though no, really, Jesus is Paul. And you have this – you're absolutely right. There's so many things – I think it's fair to remain agnostic on really what the truth is because we can't really know and say, you know what? Nope. One thing we can know is a lot of this is fiction. That's for certain. That's what we can know. That's what we can know. Yeah. And 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 I would say the fact that simply archaeology provides no evidence for someone called Paul. You know, there's nothing, you know, Interesting enough, in his supposed life, he, he meet he meets kings, doesn't he? He meets the uh, you know uh, the, 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 the the governor and the king uh, in in in, uh, in uh, Galilee. Um, he meets the governor of uh, Cyprus when he goes there. You know, he meets a lot of important people, but none of them. None of them record any of this. No historian records any of this. It's it's only only later Christians record this guy. Yeah, no, you think, uh, you know, <laughs> you, 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 you honestly can't accept it as anything other than a story, you know. I totally agree. I think that, that there's but a lot a... there. Uh-huh. Go ahead. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to visit all the places on the, uh, the, the Pauline itinerary. You know, I've been to a lot of them. Um, Unfortunately, at the moment, Syria is a little bit of a challenge. You know, I can't quite get to Syria. <laughs> at least it's a bit too dangerous to get there at the moment. But I'd like to get there sometime. I don't blame um, But you see, you know, and, and of course, there's a. you remember how in Damascus there's a, a street called Straight, isn't there? There's yeah. a street called Straight. And, and, and Christians will sometimes tell you, it says in the Bible there's a street called Straight in Damascus. And if you go to, you know, to Damascus, there is a street called Straight, yeah? But they don't, won't tell you it wasn't named a street called Straight in the Roman era at all, you know? It's a much later identification, but it just sort of 
fits with them. It, it sort of helps the, those little nuggets that yeah. make you think, oh, yeah, there's, there's something there. And, and that that's, happens, of course, what they do. Is, yeah, that happens a lot. I mean, it, it, it's, you know, and, and I mean, I'm going to go ahead and bring the topic up because I remember Dr. Price debating Bart Ehrman, and Bart Ehrman was like kind of mocking and laughing at the idea that Nazareth was in a place. You know, of course it was a place. He's like, and I hate that mythicists even make that argument uh, that that Nazareth was no place at the time of the first century. It was a place, and they have found it, and this and that. Well, is it true that a lot of these New Testament stories have influenced the geography uh, rather than the geography is actually just being inserted into the New Testament? You see what I'm saying? Like you're talking about with the street, isn't it? Yep. Doesn't it seem that the church is now naming places based off their text? Absolutely, absolutely. And if they did that in the 6th century, you're none the wiser, are you? You're, and they're not going to tell you that's what happened in the 6th century, but that's what, that's what did happen in the 6th century. You know, Romans didn't call streets straight. You know, there's the decumanius, you know. <laughs> you know, and, 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 you know they, they didn't use terms like that. And it isn't straight anyway. I, you know, you look at it on a map and it's got a doublet in it. But anyway, you know, but there's so much stuff where there's layers added on. And, of course, you've got this whole army of both academics and schol scholars like Bart Ehrman who, who muddy the water and use their, their, their reputation to give reassurance all the time. You know, so someone like Bert Ehrman saying, of course there was Nazareth. Well, thousands of people will take that as red. It's Bart Ehrman saying it, it's, it's, they'll take it as red. You know, there may have been a little hamlet there. I think the gospel says the city of Nazareth, mm. you know, the city of the Polis Nazare. It doesn't talk about a little tiny hamlet, you know. So what happened to the city then? What happened to the city? You know, it, 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 I, I, well, there's none of that story. I don't know which is the best bit to even even a, a start from, but you know, uh, do we believe? Does, does Bart Ehrman ever believe in in the nativity? Is it that anything else for him? Yeah, no, that's interesting. You bring that up. Is there any other? Because uh, I, I want to mine you of some of these examples. Uh, do you have any other examples that you could give of? Uh, uh, even if it's not archaeological or geographically related, some interesting things that just red flag and you're like, that definitely is later or that is that's a myth, that's fiction. Any details? Because I know you have a tons. Uh, plug in your well, YouTube let's, channel. <laughs> let's, let's take one of my favorites that comes to mind. Um, let's take Peter. Let's take Peter. You know, a, a, a twiddle dum to a twiddle d. You know, um, if we have Paul, then we have Peter, uh, and of course the Vatican, as we all know, is built on the well, the grave of Peter. Is that where it is? Is it really? Is it really? They have explored. I mean, it's a lovely story if, you, if we've got time to tell it. You know, during during the Second World War, the Vatican had the archaeologists uh, dig under the, uh, the the high altar of St. Peter's because they thought, well, maybe we'll find the bones of Peter, you know. Might be the... Now, as it happened, St. Peter's is built over a pagan graveyard, right? So the chances of digging down and finding bones are really quite high, you know. You do dig down and you do find bones. It's a little bit questionable whether you actually find a Christian saint's bones by doing that. You know, but there you go. Now, they approached this this uh, discovery. Well, they, 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 they approached looking for what they hoped to find, right, by drinking through this pagan graveyard and eventually came close to the altar. And then they sort of got underneath the altar and, and were coming up. And what they found, actually, was basically a hole, right? A empty hole, which would have been where the corpse of Peter might have been if he had existed and if he had been buried there, right? Well, they found an empty place, and, and the archaeologists who did that recorded that. There was nothing to be found. So the Pope at the time made a sort of message that they think they've 
found the, the grave of Peter, but, you know, but we'll let it go at that. And the devout, of course, believed. So, you know, and then some years later, a female archaeologist and a friend of the, the, the new pope, uh, um, she she decided it wasn't good enough. We could get a better version of the truth than the one that the archaeologist had done the digging. And so she went back to the the, the boxes of, of stuff that had been dug out. And, and she was very lucky that some particular workman remembered some box, right? And he produced this box with some bones. And lo and behold, they identified the bones as from a... A, a strong, large man of the sort of Mediterranean extraction, yeah? And then, to, to you know, to, to, to icing on the cake, of course, bones weren't in the, in the grave at that time. The bones were in the, a wall above the grave, right? Above the grave. And um, scratched on the wall in minuscule letters hardly discernible, except to this female, um, was the name Peter. Oh, well, that's it then. <laughs> She'd found proof. The scratching, which in, in, was it Latin? Was it Greek? Was scratching. She identified, and they were about the size of postage stamp, and she identified that as obviously the reverence of early Christians to mark this grave as, you know, I mean, if it was Peter, wouldn't they have carved it in big letters, but no, scratched on the side this little bit. And and then they, they announced that they'd found the grave of Peter and Hunky Dory. And, you know, and, and you think, well, it's like those who want to believe will believe, won't they? Those who want to, the fact that it, there is just a, a, a you know, this dreadful fraud being perpetrated it's just uh, i mean i've even got a few catholic friends i have the same issue with them they, you know they, they they sort of bit, a bit of their brain gets switched off you know because it's faith isn't it it's faith yeah you can't do anything about that i mean it's just something that they themselves somehow it has to switch over uh you know i wanted to bring up something because it was brought up uh one of my friends that i do interview on here as well um, he mentioned the pilot stone. Do you have any thoughts on the pilot stone and the James Arch, uh, uh, Arch, uh, or whatever the, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, the pilot stone. Yeah, they're great. Yeah. There, and there really is a pilot stone. There really is a pilot stone. Um, it, in a theater in Caesarea, um, in secondary use was a stone that had come from an altar or a sort of a, more of a, 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 a sort of ceremonial altar, perhaps, um, that Pilate had dedicated to Tiberius, I believe it was. You know, so here's an evidence of Pilate, um, who was not a procurator, he was a prefect, and honouring his emperor, Tiberius. And then a later emperor knocked it down and it got put into this uh, theatre. And so the pilot zone exists. Now, Christians will try and tell you, well, that's the, the, that, that confirms the whole nine yards of Jesus Christ. It has nothing to say about Jesus Christ. It just shows that Romans built lots of monuments to lots of people and occasionally recycled them. You know, what's, what's so special about that? Um, the James Oshery, well, phew, that's a lovely story, isn't it? Um, it, 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 re, it relates to a... A notorious antiquities dealer and fraudster, um, Gollan, I believe his name was, who, you know, he claimed he had this ossuary. Um, he kept it in his house for about 25 years since he was a boy, I was 16 or whatever it was. But then, then he sort of, sort of invited a, um, a, a French scholar to come and have a look at it because he thought he had an interesting inscription on it. And lo and behold, the French scholar identified it. Uh, James, the, the, the son of Joseph, the brother of Jesus on it. You know, oh, wow. <laughs> Evidence here of, of, of Jesus. But, oh, good. I mean, just cutting the long the story short, even the Israeli Antiquities Authority didn't buy this because... This same guy, antiquities dealer come fraudster, also had the only evidence of the Solomon's Temple. You know, he had the one little vase. No, nowhere anyone ever found evidence of Solomon's Temple. Just maybe it's a myth. 
you know, but we'll come on to that on another day. But, you know, he, he, he found this it's sort of uh, part of a, 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 a priestly staff that he'd had. And that was something else he had, you know, that he had produced. But the thing was, what he was doing, as someone can do now, you can buy a book of inscriptions. They're published, great fat volumes, all the inscriptions are found. He found an, a, a blank ossuary and, and he, he sort of superimposed the letters. He aged it in a, in, in, over years to make the right patina to cover it. You know, he even used grains of atomic uh, uh, traces of gold so it looked like gold had melted onto it. You know, everything you might do to authenticate it. So the experts doing their tests, find all this traces of gold here, and, you know, it looks like this was when the temple burnt down. The whole thing is just... Well, it's a minefield, isn't it? A minefield, because if if you've got something that's potentially worth, you know, five million, ten million, you know, you're going to spend a few bob and a few months getting it ready, aren't you? And that's exactly <laughs> what the Collins, you know, that's exactly what. And of course, the believers fall for it. The experts are easily fooled, you know. Yeah, Professor oh, Eisenman, <laughs> I think, when that first was revealed, Professor Eisenman actually was went on record saying it's a fraud right off the bat, and. uh and they were asking him why, and I think he had issues with what was being said on the side. Uh, he he took he took issue with what was being said, and he was explaining it. And they were like, "You're telling us on record that quick after seeing it," and you know he's been immersed in in this stuff for a while and stuff. And he's like, "Yeah, it's a fraud. Like it's definitely not authentic." And he went on record doing that too, which is interesting. You can see that on YouTube as well. Um, what else is there that's just wackadoodle? Uh, um, Shroud. <laughs> yeah, I love it, this. It's all wet. <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, the Shroud of Turin, that's something that's so much later. That's almost like another conspiracy type thing that doesn't even really like no real historians using that. So let's talk about serious supposed evidence. All right. So we talked about the pilot stone, right? We would suggest there was a real Pontius Pilate. Tacitus comes on in the second century saying Crestus, okay, was crucified. Textually, how do you deal with some of those things when uh, – do you think that there was a – that he's writing a report from people who are espousing this idea and telling him, hey, look, this is the story and he's writing it? Or do you think church fathers may have interpolated these things into these historians' texts? What do you think's happening here with those kind of things? You know what I mean? Well, yeah. OK, T Tacitus is possibly – uh, a, a good starting point if if uh, you, you want to push back against all the mythicist case, because here's a, a respected historian and he repeats elements of the, the, the Christians like, you know. Right. Um, and, and so you think, OK, well, the first thing to say about Tacitus, well, of course, he isn't an eyewitness. He wasn't even born during the life of Jesus. You know, he wasn't, you know, you know it, this is something he's written in the early second century, in actual fact. So it's a long time after. So where would he have got his information from? Now, sometimes certain stupid Christians suggest that he's gone through the official archives as if he finds, oh, yeah, Jesus, Jesus Christ was crucified today. You know, it's sort of sent him from the, 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 their out, outpost in, in, in Judea. Uh, but he, he didn't. He's just repeating a story that, that told of his own time and that Christians were obviously saying that's how they, 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 uh, they, they got their stories and he's, he's not spending too much time time on it and and and, and it's just a, like a little tidbit that he's put in there that about the christians what i find interesting about tacitus is his references to nero in that context because what i feel very strongly that one of the biggest injustices that are, are, are done to ancient is history is this bad mouthing of nero as some sort of antichrist or even a rotten guy you know nero 
had his weaknesses and his faults, of course, but so did all the Romans, all the Roman emperors, you know, and he was not a bad guy. He didn't invade anybody, right? He didn't invade anybody. What did he want to do? He wanted to be an entertainer. He wanted to sing and perform in front of the public. That's what annoyed the Russian aristoc the, the Roman aristocracy. You know, he wasn't the, the, strong, the strong man conqueror. He was a, a soft, uh, fun-loving guy. He used to have terrific parties. What's so bad about that? You know, and after the after the you know and, and Rome often caught fire. There was nothing special particularly about the fire that affected Nero's reign, and he corrected the, the, the damage fairly quickly. But again, who were pissed off by it? Primarily the, the, the aristocracy, because it was their some of their prime areas that he then had to knock down and he decided, all right, I'll build myself a nice palace. I'll replan the city centre and build a nice palace, right? And so historians who were representing the, 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 the senatorial class had every reason in the world to badmouth Nero. So they did. They did. He wasn't a particularly bad guy, but they did that. OK, yes, he he murdered his mother. Let's just say that up front. He murdered his mother. But she was a career politician who was trying to be boss herself. So it was, a, you know, one of those inevitable things. Uh, um, but OK, now, the Christians, when they latched on to Nero, he, he played into their story wonderfully because they... Um, came out with this idea that he burnt Christians uh, in, 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 and blamed them for the fire. Now, actually, when you think about that whole story sensibly, you realise it couldn't have happened. The fire occurred, it went out, they put it out. You know, After a, a few days, it was out. They started rebuilding. When... When did this supposed massacre of the Christians occur? You know, immediately, you know, or a few months later? You know, you can't actually say. And there's no evidence of any of that stuff. Where did they hang, you know, burn them, you know, hang, hang them for some sort of a, a exhibition centre? No evidence of that at all. So I feel very much that, that Nero needs to be rehabilitated because this idea, you know, not only do you get this so-called massacre of the Christians, and we have no evidence that there were Christians in Rome at that time at all, this is the first evidence of Christians. If you say, where's the evidence that Christians were ever in Rome before the end of the first century? I would say, oh, Nero's fire. That's when they were. You know, but you, you, you know, it's, if it, if that's not true, then they're going, there were no Christians there, and then they sort of rope in the idea Peter and Paul were part of it, and you think, what? How do you get that to match? How do you get them in there to, you know, to, so? But of course, by by burning them in Rome, Peter and Paul were made honorary Romans, and from that point on. The religion that had spur, you know, overflowed out of Judea became a, a religion from Rome, and Rome could start to fashion it because, after all, Peter and Paul were now Romans, and so it was Roman Catholicism emerged. You know, and, yeah. and what happened? You know, Jerusalem and so on starts to you know, disappear off the map. You know, the centre of, of of gravity has moved yeah. into, into into Italy. It's funny you say that because uh, James Valiant and Warren Fye, they wrote the book Creating Christ. And um, they kind of actually delve into some of these details in their book showing that what we might be seeing here, if there were persecuted Christians who had a possible Christ of their follower, um, possibly. Suppose there was. So suppose – what if Tacitus is recording that there really were uh, these Christians – they say these are not the Christians that you think. These are probably militant Jews who were messianic in nature, and they had nothing to do with the Gospels or Pauline theology at all. And they hijacked this story saying, hey, we're going to build this fiction off of possible historical things. And this is why historians are scratching their heads today going, duh, it's, you didn't know this is history? And... So there's definite fabrication that I think is going on here, if that is a plausible explanation, that, look, there were Messianic Jewish people 
And then no wonder Paul takes this thing and goes, hey, it doesn't matter if you're Torah at all. And and what do you think the pagans can do with that? They can do a lot with that. So now you've got what you're showing. It goes from Jerusalem to, I mean, here we are with the with the Roman Catholic Church down the road. It evolved. And, Absolutely. And so that Absolutely. would be... Would yep. you agree that maybe if there is real history there with Tacitus, it's not talking about the same group? And it's not really even because because the complicated part is where he says Crestus, right? And they're like, oh, that means that's Jesus. But the thing is, is, is mm. this because even if there was a guy who got crucified by by uh, uh, by Pontius Pilate, the gospel hands down is a fictional account. So um, we're not denying like what we talked about with Paul, right? Paul's a fictional account of a person. Paul at, at sometimes is Josephus. So there's bones of history possibly, but they're so fictionalized and mythologized. If there was a guy, his name wasn't called Jesus, Tacitus would have said, hey, there's Jesus. Jesus got crucified. He says Crestus, which is obviously the messianic leader, possibly, if that's even a way to understand it. Awesome. So we're so skeptical. Yeah. We don't know. We know it was a common name. We know it was a common name for a start, Crestus. Yeah. We, it was a slave name as much as anything else. Oh, wow. Um, so we know that. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, all these stories have been massaged so much. I mean, it does take something like an army of scholars and the internet to start unraveling <laughs> it all. You know, it's only because it's so ridiculous that we can ever achieve it, you know, because the, the stories are so blatant. The, 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 it's only the sheer volume of them trying to deal with them all. But, yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> I love this. Look, Ken, I really do love this. Man, how can I get you to come back on sooner than later? Because you're a fascinating guest. Well, it, 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 yeah, you, you just got to get hold of me somehow. I mean, uh, um, I'm, I'm getting back more into Jesus right now. Okay. Um, it's, it's getting a bit more of my attention. You, you, as you know, I've been a bit dif distracted of, of late. Um, yes, but yeah, why not? Why not? I, when I'm on form, when I'm on form, I can speak about Jesus all night. You know. <laughs> oh, I love it. You I... might want to, might not want to listen, but I can spout about Jesus endlessly. <laughs> Dude, no, you know I'm eating this up, so for sure, I love it, and I'm glad that we finally connected. Um, how do people help with your process in bringing more of this to the table? And um, is there is there a way that they can help? I mean, what, what can they do? Um, well, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm happy that people can, you know, can be, certainly they can email me. That's, that's fine. They can make suggestions. I'll try and keep up with, with reasonable emails. Um, they can buy the book. They can, uh, uh, cl click on the YouTube channels. Uh, uh, those sort of things help. I mean, I, yeah. Uh, any suggestions? <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. I know, and you got a PayPal, right? Is there a way that if someone wanted to donate, they could donate? Oh, they yeah, they can yeah. They they they're they it's something I I have been really slow to do, but yes, there are there are contribution buttons on on my on my website, not oh. on not on uh, YouTube. Okay. Yeah, but not on my not on YouTube, but on my on my website. Yep, there there are contribution buttons if if someone so mind. And I'm pleased to say it just shows you without any real prompting for me. Uh, I've had some really nice. Uh, contributions from from people because I mean I make jokes about it all because how else can you tolerate all this nonsense you know it's the only way you can get through it um, but some people uh, send me really really you know heart, heartfelt uh, thanks because they have been abused by the church you know they have been abused by religion and sometimes in in terrible ways you know whether it's as children or as adolescents or what have you or, or even you know i've had people write to me i've been a pastor for 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 for, for 30 years and i've suddenly realized or i've eventually realized this is all horseshit and i'm getting out you know it's it, you, you, you know, it's, it's it's refreshing when when you, when you you you, know, you get that sort of feedback yeah I mean, the christians i always I always know the believers because they're they're very fond of quoting a bit of their scripture and and praying for me that's what i usually do they pray for me and, I, and usually spell it all wrong and get the grammar wrong you know and you know they're struggling 
Um, because I suppose if, the, if they built a world view on it, it's, 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 it's a bit of a hard, you know, hard swallow. But there you go. Do you want to live in reality or with a delusion? Well, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> Ken Humphreys was joining us here on Myth Vision. Go to his website, Jesus never existed dot com if you like what we're doing here show us some love down in the description you can hit us up on the paypal i always plug this not very many people do it uh very rarely do we get it but when you guys help us we get to bring on guests and when we have some funds in the purse i can offer our guests for their time to bring them on you guys request all the time you want certain people you want to see this you want to see that we're more than happy to do that. If you guys can help us to get them on the show to interview, that would be great. So uh, I just want to plug that in there for anyone who's watched this far. Ken, thank you for joining us on here. And look, next time we gotta go. We gotta go do this again for, for sure. It's been a pleasure. It's been a pleasure, and I look forward to that. Yep, real soon. Yes, sir. Take care now. Peace. <laughs>